So let's get started. I'd like to hand it over to our first panelist. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, welcome to the Ask Me Anything virtual event for the Department of Management Sciences. Uh, I'm Hossein Abu Mehizi, the Associate Chair for Graduate Studies. And I'm here today to briefly dis uh, discuss about the Department of Management Sciences. Uh, the Department of Management Sciences has three main areas, operation research, information system, and management of technology. Uh, in the area of operation research, our main focus is on uh, supply chain type of problem, logistics problem, revenue management, and pricing. And then we apply different tools like data analytics tools, machine learning tools. I'm going to discuss uh, the, the different uh, research areas that we have in more detail later on. We also have information systems. In information system, uh, we have people that are working uh, in the area of data science, uh, uh, search engines, natural language processing, human computer interactions. Lukash will provide you with more uh, information about this area. And we also have management of technology. In the management of technology, we have people with the background uh, in organization behavior, management of technology, economics, psychology. And we have Keja here to provide you with more details about uh, this area. Before we discuss the more, in more detail the areas that we have and the research focus that we have in the department, I, I, would, I would like to briefly discuss about the type of program that we have in the department. Uh, we have both masters and PhD programs. In the master's program, we have two types of masters. One master's is basically course-based master that uh, you can come and take eight courses. There would be no research involved in, in this program. And it could be either regular, like in person on campus, or it could be online. And we also have a research-based master program, which is called Master of Applied Sciences which in that uh, program, you need to take four courses and also you need to have a research of, uh, as your thesis. And we also have a PhD uh, program, which you need to take four courses. For the regular master uh, program, which is a course-based program, you, you, the, you can finish the program in one year if you, have a, if you, you, if you will be a full-time student. Or if you're a part-time student, it, it may take two, two to three uh, years. And you have the option of uh, co-op. We'll discuss the co-op program and then GDDA later on. And of course, for the online, it's a part-time program and it, it may take two, two to three years. For the MASC program, research-based master program, it could be full-time two years or part-time three years. And the same thing for the PhD, it could be four years, um, if you are a full-time, or it could be uh, five years or more than five years if you are a part-time student. One of the areas that uh, we have in the, in the department, as I mentioned, is data analytics. And you can, if you are a master uh, in the program of Master of Management Sciences, which is a course-based program, you can get a diploma in data analytics. This diploma is designed so that you, you will get a deep knowledge in the areas of statistics. You actually take two courses in the statistics, one as a core course and one uh, as a course for the GDDA. Then you will take a, a courses in the area of data analytics and machine learning. And then you eventually will take courses around operation analytics, which means that how you're going to apply quantitative analysis in the to make informed decisions. We also have a co-op program. For the, the co-op program uh, is for top students in the program, which is, uh, which is going to be uh, after you join the program, either MASC or MMSC, then in the first term of your program, if you are a top, pro, top student in the program, you have 85 or plus average in the fall term, then you are eligible to apply for a co-op program. Then in the co-op program, after studying two terms, 
fall and winter in the in the program, then you can go and work in at the organization for two terms and then come back to finish your uh, your program. As, as you see here, you need to have two work term reports to, to, be, to be eligible to get the degree in the co-op program. If you have a more question about the program, we would be happy to discuss it in the Q&A part. Now, goes to the graduate studies life. Are you? Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll just give a quick introduction and then pass it over to Danielle for her quick introduction before we get into things. So I'm a second year uh, PhD student in the management sciences department. Um, my co-supervisors are Dr. Rob Dumering and Dr. Mark Hancock. And my research focuses on distributed group problem solving. Um, and Danielle, if you could quickly introduce yourself. Um, yeah. Hey everyone, my name is Danielle. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Waterloo. Um, I came here for my master's in 2016, and I liked it so much that I stuck around for a PhD as well. Um, some of the reasons I applied to management sciences at Waterloo was um, its great reputation for applied operations research and a great supervisor. I worked for Dr. Mahludzadeh that I really like working with and is doing active, innovative work in my field. Um, and what I study is applied operations research, often in a healthcare setting, and most of my work so far has focused on optimizing radiation therapy treatments for cancer patients. So the biggest challenge of transitioning from undergraduate studies to graduate studies is uh, that so you sometimes find yourself with a lot more freedom to choose your own path. But the flip side is that there's actually a lot more responsibility on your end. Besides meeting deadlines, you set your own goals and milestones and have to spearhead your own projects. So while that gives you more flexibility to manage your schedule, you still have to stay organized and motivated. In terms of supervisors, your supervisors are there to guide you and support you as you narrow down your research goals and help you plan how you will achieve them. I chose my supervisors because I had previously taken some courses with them, and I really loved the way that they challenged me to think and the topics that they taught. If I was a new incoming student and I didn't previously work with any supervisors, I would probably take the time to read over each of their CVs online and see what kind of topics they're interested in and what they publish in and if that aligns with my own personal interests. For working on campus, before the pandemic, I lived in Waterloo, but have since then moved to Toronto to live with my family. But while I was in Waterloo, I loved working on campus. As a research student, you'll be given an office to work in, whereas coursework students have several study spaces and lounges around campus that they can use. Campus is extremely safe, and I highly enjoyed working at the libraries and getting bubble tea from Sweet Dreams, which is a cute little cafe just outside of campus. Um, but now that I work at home, the transition hasn't been as drastic and hasn't affected my workflow as a grad student. The amount that I work is still the same, which is probably around 40 hours a week, but for example, because there's more freedom with graduate studies, I'm personally more of a night owl and I'm more productive when I work at night. And I can do that because my schedule is flexible enough to allow that. Okay, anything else to add, Ariel, Danielle? Uh, I think I, I got this slide. <laughs> uh, so okay. just a little bit more, uh, incentive to choose management sciences here at Waterloo. Uh, we've got a really strong faculty here um, in a number of different fields, including operations research, which is my field. Um, they, the faculty has a lot of close industry ties, which means that there's lots of opportunities for collaboration. Um, I chose my supervisor, I think Ariel already sort of touched on this by um, identifying what my personal research interests were and then looking at what research uh, my supervisor had published. Um, and a question that I've seen a lot is, how do I pick a research project? So if you're course-based, um, this won't apply to you. Uh, but if you're a master's and this is something you're stressed about, don't worry too much. Your supervisor will probably help you identify a promising direction and look into it. Um, at a PhD level, you can generally start to identify questions that you'd like to personally pursue within your own field. 
which I found really cool so far. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, now we would like to provide you with more uh, detail about the research areas that we have in the department and what we really do in different areas. I'm going through the OR part of it, operation research, and then we have uh, Lucas and Kejia to, to discuss about the IS and the management of technology areas. Let me provide you with a brief uh, uh, discussion about the operation research and what we do in the operation research. Basically, the goal in the operation research is to analyze a system, understand a system, and try to see how we can improve the efficiency of the system um, and then increase the revenue or other performance measures that we have. To, uh, for, uh, for a very concrete example, just you can think about uh, healthcare. And the healthcare during the pandemic and the post pandemic, one of the challenges that many countries are facing, including Canada and UK, especially those that they, are, they have non for profit healthcare system, is elective surgeries. In Ontario, we have, I think, more than 16 million medical procedure delay, is around 500,000 MRI services delay. And it is, is now the Ontario government priority to, to reduce this backlog or clear this backlog. Actually, Ontario government just put, a, uh, put aside 300, more than $300 million to remove this backlog, okay? Then what we can do as operation research people, we can analyze the data. We can see how we can schedule or reschedule these sur surgeries across different hospitals different health providers to reduce the wait time. Actually, we have now uh, several students working with MR, Ontario MRI data for uh, scheduling. Another area in operation research that nowadays working is retail analytics, like the company like Lobla. There are many questions that they need to answer, like inventory management, how they need to manage their inventory, how they, uh, they can provide promotions, what would be the best strategy for assortment, putting these products together um, at a one particular location, warehouse management. These are the type of questions that, that we are investigating and trying to uh, helping this company uh, to, to uh, understand the concept and then find the answer for that. Another area is the supply chain management. Just look at the chaos in the, in the world supply chain now and management nowadays. Just you need to just Google supply chain and you see 100 different news about the supply chain. What happened that we have a shortage in supply chain? Then to understand the supply chain, what the supply chain really means, the bottlenecks in the supply chains, the, the concept in the supply chain, what are the main um, parts in the supply chain and how we can improve the efficiency in the supply chain. This is a topic that we discuss and actually we have many faculty in the department that they are working on. Environment, nowadays are, is in the news. We have people that they are working in the area of environment and how we can, for example, reduce the carbon dioxide or other, or other performance, improve the other performance in the environment. Therefore, operation research is, is an area that, that provides the techniques, tools to analyze the system and see how you can improve the system. And the good thing about operation research is that if you want to do a very rigorous analytical analysis uh, uh, using your strong background in math, you can do it. We have a student that uh, I, I actually had a student that finished his master's here working on the, uh, on the MRI problem and now is a PhD, started his PhD at Stanford University. At the same time, if you do not want to apply a very rigorous math and you want to apply simulation or other tools with the basic modeling, you can also uh, uh, do it. And therefore, this is the, the, the main um, focus of operation research to, to provide you with the techniques as, as basic as modeling techniques, simulation that you can understand the system and analyze it to the very uh, high level uh, analytical techniques like the uh, data-driven optimization and other techniques to, uh, to analyze the system and see how we can improve the performance of the system. 
here is a list of the different topics that that we are doing but but uh, you can look at the slides later on now i pass it to lukash professor gola to discuss the is area okay hello um, so um, uh, faculty members in the Department of Management Sciences as a whole have uh, diverse research interests, but even if we zoom into uh, the uh, information systems group, there are diverse interests within the group and a variety of uh, research projects that graduate students can choose from. Um, at a high level, I would categorize the uh, uh, IS research into research in human computer interaction, um, information retrieval and search engines, natural language processing and uh, data science slash machine learning slash artificial intelligence. Um, so in human computer interaction, um, there are specific, some specific projects in a user interface design and also uh, broader projects in the space of how humans interact with technology. Uh, for example, how users interact uh, in uh, virtual reality environments. Uh, in um, information retrieval and search engines, one of the most difficult problems is how to rank search results. So when you type in a query to Google, for example, right, you get back a ranked set of results with the most relevant results at the top. And it's this relevance ranking that, um, uh, that, that can be difficult in practice to make sure that specific users um, who are writing these queries receive uh, the most relevant results to them. Um, in the space of natural language processing, um, our recent research in the group has focused on using deep learning to analyze text. Um, and I will give you a couple of examples. Um, one interesting example um, has to do with um, a concept called style transfer. So imagine you're reading a play by Shakespeare. Um, if you read enough, uh, Shakespeare's works, you'll notice a pattern. You'll notice that Shakespeare writes in a certain style. Um, the idea in natural language processing and style transfer is to extract these stylistic elements from text so that they can be transferred to a different piece of text. So uh, if, um, if I happen to have such a tool, I could then take um, a document that I wrote and convert it into a style that looks like it was written by Shakespeare while preserving the meaning of the document, just the style changes. That's what's meant by style transfer. Um, another recent example is, a, uh, is an online uh, tool uh, that exists um, on one of our faculty members' web pages, which um, automatically generates lyrics to a piece of music. So you plug in, uh, you plug in a sound source. You play a piece of music. You play the guitar, and uh, on the screen you get back some lyrics that match the mood of the or the style of the music that you're playing. Um, and then let me give a few examples in the context of data science and machine learning. Um, so um, one important. Um, our research area recently has been image recognition. And this is especially important for em emerging applications such as self-driving cars. Um, so the idea is to take in an image and to um, guess whether this image contains a particular object, for example, a person or a cat or a dog or for self-driving cars, another car <laughs> that's nearby. Uh, and the state of the art solutions um, use uh, deep learning, which is not always interpretable. And what I mean by that is, is that um, the tool itself doesn't always tell you how it, it, how it made a prediction decision. So it's important to, um, it's important to, pr to, to produce or to provide some interpretation um, to, um, to these automated uh, prediction results in many applications, you know, including healthcare and, and others. Um, so one project that I personally um, uh, have is to, um, is to take the results of a a deep learning model for, for image recognition and to audit the model in some sense to make sure that, um, in, for example, that if the model guesses that there is a cat in the picture, that that is correlated with the picture also containing a shape like a circle for the cat's head and a rectangle for the tail and four rectangles for, uh, for, the, for, for the legs. Okay. Um, one more example in, in the space of data science um, was to um, 
uh, was to use data-driven methods to um, understand and mitigate the gender gap in science and engineering. And the approach that we used was to analyze admission applications to undergraduate engineering programs at the University of Waterloo. And one of the questions in the application form uh, asks uh, prospective students to uh, tell us why you're interested in becoming an engineer. So we built an AI um, and uh, text analytics pipeline that takes, uh, takes in those, those answers, which are just written in free text, and extracts um, sentences that uh, correspond to potential reasons why applicants are interested in becoming uh, engineers. And uh, then we did a statistic, statistical study of differences between men and women, um, showing, that, uh, showing that gender plays a role in the reasons for becoming an engineer. And some of the insights from this study uh, may be useful in, um, uh, in redesigning uh, university outreach programs in, in science and engineering. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Lukash. The next research area is the MOT, Keja, please. Uh, hi. Um, so uh, in MOT, we are um, also very diverse. We have faculties from uh, the backgrounds from uh, uh, psychology, psychology, um, uh, sociology, and economics. So we basically cover everything, but we are not typical engineering. Um, so uh, what we do is mostly focus on um, how technology, how technological diverse, uh, sorry, uh, how technological development shapes and is shaped by the social context. So we we focus on understanding the social context of uh, technology and innovation in general. Um, so uh, some of the examples, for example, um, uh, the te recent technological developments, uh, how how do innovations diffuse, for example, in, in the society? How come sometimes you see some really nice technologies uh, don't get adopted, uh, they don't get popular, um, and what caused that? So, so uh, the social context of technological de uh, developments is important to understand uh, questions like that. Um, and also sometimes we also look at, for example, the unintended uh, social consequences of certain technological development. For example, AI, everybody is talking about AI, using AI, but what are the, uh, uh, some unintended social uh, uh, outcome of AI or even dark side of AI? Like how does AI, um, the decisions based on AI can introduce uh, biases or even, um, you know, um, discrimination in organizational decision making. Um, and uh, we do research uh, by a lot of uh, diverse methods. So we do have faculty members who, who use experiment, for example, to study uh, individual decision making, um, especially when it's uncertain or when they make uh, risky decisions. So how, um, why and how humans have uh, biases um, and how do they develop the heuristics um, over time, um, mostly unintentional, right? So these are all um, problems that organizations might face um, when they make critical decisions. Um, we would also, um, um, sometimes we also use a surveys. Um, that's a very uh, kind of old tradition uh, sociological uh, methods. Um, and we also have economic, economists in the department who usually works uh, with the big data. Uh, for example, they look at the patents data and develop the most um, recent trends of uh, technological development. See, how does the technological development landscape is uh, evolving over time? So which technologies gets uh, um, developed faster and uh, how novel they are, how path-breaking they are. Um, and finally, we have uh, uh, a general organizational uh, research focusing on uh, organizational design change, like how to design organization to promote innovation. Um, how do organizations change? How do organizations make decisions? And how do they learn over time and how they manage their knowledge 
um, over time. So these are all important questions to understand in order to understand the development process of innovation. That's Thanks, all. Okay, let me also briefly discuss about the admission and funding, and then we'll go to Q&A part of the session. Uh, for the admission uh, for MMSC and MASC and PhD, uh, you should have uh, the minimum average of 75%. Of course, for master is 75% and for PhD uh, is 83%. If you want to have a research project, which means that if you want to come to MASC or PhD program, you need to find a supervisor. Uh, and then when you apply, you can mention the potential supervisor that you want to work with, or you can also uh, contact them in advance. The, the main focus in the department is that because we, we want to make sure that the students can take courses around the statistics, machine learning, and optimization, then uh, uh, we would like to have students with a background, strong background in quantitative methods. And of course, English is a requirement by the university. About the tuition, if you want to apply for MASC or PhD program, I would say, don't worry about it because you will get a scholarship and then you will have a supervisor who pay GRS. Therefore, that should not be the big issue. I will talk about the scholarship and then different opportunities later on for funding. For the MMSC, for Canadian permanent residents is around for the full time. You can see here it is around 2,700 and for the international is around $14,000. And it's of course different between full-time and part-time. All the information is here. And if you have any question, we can discuss in the Q and A uh, part. But I just want to talk about the funding available. The, for, the MA, for the MASC and PhD, then there is a GRS, there's a scholarship uh, for, for them. Then the minimum payment for MASC is $18,000. For PhD is around $25,000. And then on the top of this GRS, you are able to work as a teaching assistantship. Sorry, teaching assistant. And then as of, I think, uh, May 1st this year, it's around uh, 5,800 per term. And we have three terms. Most of our MASC and PhD students get uh, at least uh, one TA, many of them uh, two TAs per year. And even we have students that they, they get three TAs per year. The TA uh, uh, opportunity is also open to MMSC students, the course-based master students. And we have many of them that they get TAs during the year. And of course, there are some additional funding available in engineering and also at the university. Uh, uh, there are around 100, up to 100 entrance award uh, valued around $5,000. And you see here, we have fellowships and also we have this uh, tri agency award, which are the actually external awards, and then you can apply for different awards like NSEC awards, CIHR awards, Shake award, and, and so on. And of course, there are some important deadlines for those awards. If you want to apply, you should keep in mind that you need to apply, for example, for year, next um, year, there is a December 1st uh, deadline for a master's application, and then February 1st is for the OGS uh, award. And there are, for international students, also there are fundings available. Uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned, there, the, there is a GRS, a scholarship available for, for PhD students around $25,000, exact number is here, 2,404 per year. And uh, we have around 140 international students award, that I think is per year, correct me if I'm wrong. There are some other scholarships available at the university uh, as well, like IBET uh, Momentum Fellowship, and you can apply for that. It's a very prestige award recently launched and is around uh, $25,000 for four years. Now, how we can apply for the management sciences? It's easy. You can go to the department website, look for future graduate students. The link is here. 
you see, you can explore the different programs that we have, and then you will see the admission requirements. And then you can, uh, there is a website, online website that you can upload your applications. If you want to uh, apply for MASC or PhD research based programs, you can contact a potential supervisor to, to see if they are taking new students. And then you can mention their name in your application. And there is a deadline for application that is, I think, February 1st, keep in, keep in mind. I think that's it. My talk and brief semi uh, brief overview of the department. Sarah, back to you. All righty. So thank you so much to all of our panelists. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we're ready to begin the Q&A session. So as a reminder, continue to submit your questions using the Q&A button within your webinar screen and upvote any questions you wanna hear the answer to. So our first question, I'm gonna to direct to you, Hossein. Um, typically when a student is trying to decide between the course-based MMSC and the research-based MASC, what kind of considerations should they be making um, between the two? Like how do they decide which one's right for them? Okay, first of all, even if they do the students that they come to the program as MMSC after the first year, then they can find the potential supervisor and then change their program to MASC. Therefore, they, knew they do not need to stay in MMSC. And even the department has some uh, the scholarship available for top student MMSC if they want to change it to MMSC. But the main difference between the MMSC program and MASC program is the, the research component of it. If you go to the MMSC program, you take eight courses. Of course, courses have their own research, sorry, their own projects that you need to handle, but there is no research involved. In the MASC program, you should be interested in conducting uh, research as your uh, thesis. Uh, therefore, that's the main difference. The main difference is the research part of it. If you are interested in doing the research during your master program, you should go to MASC. But if you are mainly want to focus on the courses and then learning the, the, the some topics that you can apply in the world and then go to industry, probably MASC is a better fit. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, our next question I'm going to direct to our admissions expert, Kim. Kim, we're having a number of questions about uh, GREs and whether they're required. And even if they're not required, do they get seen by the admissions committee or potential supervisor? Could you maybe speak to that? Sure. Um, if you've taken the GRE or the GMAT, you can submit it. Um, there may not be a space for you to submit it in the application, but just attach it to your resume. Um, it's not a requirement for admissions and very rarely do, they, um, are they, or do we drill down that far to look at them. Um, but they, they can help an application, certainly, but there's no, just include it in your resume. Don't worry about it too, too much. How's that? That's perfect. Thank you so much, Kim. That's great. Um, our next question, I'm going to, I'm going to start with Danielle, maybe, and then move to Ariel. Um, what advice do you have for students who are applying right now? Like if you could give them one piece of advice, what would you tell them? Danielle, we'll start with you. Oh boy. Um, well, first off, I'd say great choice. Um, <laughs> but I guess my advice would be um, try and narrow down the schools you're applying to and get it done in advance and like look look into it. So like especially if you're really hopefully really set on management sciences, um, make sure to read all the documentation and try and have it all ready at the same time because there's like a lot of fine print a lot of little things and you don't want to be doing it while the system is frozen like the night before or you have an internet glitch. Great, thank you. I definitely echo that, Danielle. And I would also say if you're applying for the PhD program, really get to take the time to know um, which supervisors you would like and email them and try and talk to them and see what their interests are and just take the time to really uh, know your own long-term goals and what you want to do and where your interests lie so that you can make sure that they align and don't be too stressed and just try your best. Excellent. Thank you very much, both of you. That is uh, that is excellent advice. Um, Jose, maybe I'll direct this next question back to you. Some students are wondering 
how competitive is the program, each of the programs, perhaps we can talk with the MMSC and the MASC separately. Um, and do you ever admit anyone who's maybe below that 75% threshold of equivalency? Yeah, I would say our program is for sure competitive, but if you want to apply into come Waterloo, I would say for sure apply, then at least you can, I, there is always a chance if you have a strong background in the areas that you want, like the quantitative methods, or if you are, or if you are interested. Well, in general, there is a chance that if you are slightly below the, the, the requirements, but if you are far below, honestly, the chance is very low. But all of those should be considered as exceptional cases. And then, but we would look at it. This is what I can say. We cannot guarantee, but we would look at it for sure carefully to see if you have some, you know, your, you have some strengths in some areas, and then it's a good fit for us, we for sure we will consider it. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, our next question, actually, uh, Lukash, I'm going to direct to you. It's it's regarding the IS field. Um, so I'm hoping this question maybe makes a little bit more sense to you than it does to me. Is there a chance for a student to pursue a PhD working in the IS field, focusing on marketing topics? So this person is currently working on consumer journeys using deep learning methods. So I don't have uh, much uh, knowledge or experience personally in that topic, but there may be others within the department. I'm not sure, to be honest. I would say yes, because there are people in the department that they are working in the area of machine learning and analytics, and then they are interested in marketing area as well. I think we have a, uh, I think this time Dimitrov, Professor Dimitrov is interested in economics and then marketing. Uh, analysis and we have other people that you know they are working on it and as soon as it comes to analytics nowadays all of our areas they have people they are working in analytics it's not just bis we have people in the information system we have people in o mot and we, we have people in or that they are working in deep learning area i as a matter of fact myself i'm working in deep learning and reinforcement learning uh, area and i uh, apply to different you know uh, applications like healthcare, retail, and so on. Therefore, if you're interested, of course, you need to find a potential supervisor if, if you want to come for an ACO PhD, but there are people that they are working in the area of economics and marketing. Great, thank you. Um, Hossein, you had talked about in your presentation um, the GDDA, the diploma. Um, does this mean if a student takes this option, that they will graduate with two credentials, a master's degree and a diploma? Yes, one of them, yeah. For the G GDDA is a diploma. And then you are admitted to a master's MMSC per regular program. If you take eight courses, independent of GDDA, you will get a master program. But if out of that eight courses, you take four GDDA courses, you will get both MMSC degree and the GDDA diploma. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna circle back to our grad students now. Uh, maybe Ariel, you can go first on this one. Um, how much time do you spend on campus as a PhD student? And for your coursework, do you do it mostly remotely or do you do it in person? Um, so right now it's remotely, but as we're moving towards being more in person, I would assume that it would be more in person. Uh, like I said, during my talk, I actually am in Toronto right now, so I work completely remotely, uh, but I am planning to come back to campus next term. Um, I usually, I like to spend time in my office. Uh, it's a nice quiet space where I can work on my research and my plans. So I usually spend most of my time there. And there's lots of great uh, places around campus to do work and study as well. Yeah, and I, I can add that we are scheduling to bring back research students to campus. And, and of course, after that, all the students, hopefully as soon as in late November or December. Right, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so for our next question here, um, maybe Kim, I'll come back to you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the funding options that are available for, for full-time versus part-time research-based programs? 
Uh, that's funny. No, I can't. Um, there's no fun. I mostly work with the coursework programs and we don't um, provide a departmental funding for the coursework programs, but for the research programs, um, we do have funding opportunities and um, I think that I'm going to lobby that one back to Hussein because he'll know more about those details than I would. Yeah, you know, the department would love to help all of our students, independent of research or course both. For the research space, there is a university and faculty of engineering default that there is a minimum payment for them, around 25,000, as I mentioned, for the PhD and 80,000 for masters. But we have some other opportunities in the department, like, you know, teaching assistantship. The TA positions are available to all grad students. And we have, you know, MMSC students that they are. Uh, uh, they are working as TAs in the department. At the top of that, if I, uh, we also have every year at the, I think in winter, uh, the, we have some awards, scholarship awards for a very, very top students for in MMSC program as well. Back to you, Kim. Okay. Thanks, Hussein. I would just add that the teaching assistantships, um, every grad student in management sciences can apply to them, but um, there's only so many teaching assistants to go, um, assistantships to go around. So you do have to apply and um, it's not guaranteed that you would have a teaching assistant. However, there are other, are other um, opportunities, like he said, through scholarships and, and through the grad office in university. Great, thank you both. Kim, if uh, I have another question here, I think this is gonna be right in your wheelhouse. Um, can a student who starts in the MMSC online program in their first term switch to the MMSC full-time in person? Uh, and what's the process for doing that if they can? Yeah, they can. Um, and it has happened. It's not in their best interest. Most students um, think they can jump into the online program to get around the, um, the start dates and the deadlines because the online program admits year round. The on-campus program, the on-campus full-time program only has one admission. And the reason for that is because the courses that they take in the fall are the foundation courses for the rest of the program. And it opens up more um, opportunities for them in the winter and spring courses to finish up in their electives. So if they start in the fall term with in part time um, and then switch over to the full time in the winter term, they've missed those foundation courses and it's actually kind of set them behind um, the rest of their peers. So we don't really encourage that if that's what their plan is, but if they want to contact me directly, I can work with them and um, work out um, what might best be the best situation for them to get started. Excellent. That makes Thank sense. You. Yeah, it's great. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, that was my wheel. <laughs> um, so, Hossein, a little bit about admission requirements. So, PhD students should have a background in calculus and linear algebra, um, but some of these students are saying they have a statistics background and didn't get any calculus or linear algebra credits before, is this going to be a deal breaker in terms of their background to be successful in the program? Not really. We want to make sure that you have a strong background in quantitative analysis and we look at different courses that uh, you have taken during your previous degrees. And as long as, and if even you can somehow show us that you have a strong background, that that would be enough for the for admission. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Can I add, add to course, that yeah. just briefly? There are, if you're not sure if you have the math background or not, you, if you do have it, you, you know you have it. But if you're not sure, you might want to look. Uh, there's a, a selected, uh, a few courses through um, the Center for Extended Learning that you might want to take as non-degree or um, before you apply to any grad program in engineering that would um, maybe ben benefit you to build up your application a little bit. And if that's the case, you can email me again or contact me and I can provide you a short list of those that will cover the calculus, algebra, and um, statistics, is it? Or data analytics <laughs> um, courses in CEL that, that you can take before you apply. Fantastic that's advice. Thank you so much, Kim. 
Um, Jose, we're getting a lot of questions about contacting a supervisor. Um, how do you find a supervisor? Um, do they have to do it before they apply? Can they do it after they apply? All these sorts of things. What kind of advice can you give them from a faculty perspective about finding someone to lead your research-based program? Yeah, yeah, there is no, well, you know, you can, first of all, we look at all the application, even if you have someone in your application as a potential supervisor or not. Therefore, the question that if you need to uh, at, contact them before the application, well, no, but if you can contact them and find someone who is interested to working with you, that would be uh, great. And usually how you should contact, uh, we honestly receive many emails every day. And then I'm pretty sure every single faculty member in the department look at their um, emails. They, they, and then for those that they find a mutual interest, they contact it. I personally contact many students daily to, to talk with them, to look at their application, encourage them to apply. Therefore, the answer is that uh, if you do not hear from some faculty, don't be this. Uh, don't be like uh, uh, apply. Don't be afraid to apply because eventually we look at the pool of the applications and then we we try to find the best ones. And then if you if you couldn't find any potential supervisor, then there there could be some faculty members that they got some new grants during the winter and then they they want to bring the students and then they might find your application strong to work with. Excellent, thank you. Um, Danielle and Ariel, from a, from a current student perspective, Danielle, maybe we'll start with you. Um, do you have any, I know um, your, both of your journeys to find supervisors were a little bit different, but do you have any advice for finding a supervisor for, for potential prospective students? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, you definitely want to read what they're researching. Um, you don't want to just look at like the uh, the topics, but also like the methodology. So at least in our department, typically like the bread and butter of what a prof research is, is the methodology, and then they might apply it to a lot of areas. Um, so make sure that you're invested in their core methodology. Um, but you should also, when you're applying, um, it really helps if you've looked at some of their past research um, and you sound like you know what you're talking about. So some ways that I got successful responses from people, even if they <laughs> didn't end up being the people that supervised me was um, I was interested in someone's work that did visualization and I coded a quick visualization. And that was enough to look at my email. So if you somehow distinguish yourself um, from the crowd, I find that really helps and distinguish yourself as someone that's actually looked into their field and wants that position. Great, thank you. Ariel, do you have anything to add to that? Um, not really. Danielle pretty much covered everything. Um, yeah, I would just say go on the management website, management science website, um, go through each uh, professor, look at their websites, look at their CVs, um, look at what they've published, read through it. Um, and when you're contacting them, try and be a, as detailed as possible if you already know what you're interested in or if you want to have a potential research plan, include that. Um, just really take the time to think through uh, what you want to relate to them. Great. Thank you all very, very much. Kim, we have another question about the MMSC program. Um, when you're looking at your applicants beyond marks, what kind of extracurriculars and additional um, characteristics are you looking for in your applicants? Well, Sarah, it's always good to know that applicants know what a deadline means. <laughs> so, so there's that. <laughs> um, as far as extracurricular and that sort of thing, um, it helps a strong application, but it's not really a focus of the review. Um, Certain things like being succinct and clear, you can you can read um, pages and pages of research, but if you can't get to the point in the first page, um, that's what we're kind of looking for: um, clarity and and um, being able to um, read and write and understand that sort of thing would be good. But that doesn't really reflect in the application. But as much as you can make it reflect, that helps. Excellent. Thank you. And deadlines. perfect. Um, Hossein, for students that maybe have to take a leave during their studies, for example, a parental leave, um, what kind of options are available to them? 
I think you can answer better than it, but I think there is a leave available at the university for all the students. There are different leaves, and then I including the parental leave. And they, they can just apply for the for a leave, and then I'm pretty sure it would be approved for a parental leave. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Kim, uh, another question for you. About how long does it take for students, for applicants, to hear a decision about their application? Never. Forever. It takes a long time. No. All the completed applications are completed or reviewed by the graduate community after the deadline date. So if you've submitted an application in June or July for the MSI on campus, the full-time um, coursework, that de um, application deadline is February 1st. You're not gonna hear anything before that. Sometimes I'll have an opportunity to go into the application system beforehand, and I'll go through some of the incomplete applications or um, some of the applications just to kind of sort out and see what we have going. And I may have time to contact some applicants if there's missing or unclear material um, before February 1st. So early applying is still great, but you're not gonna hear anything until after the application date. Beyond that, it can be four to six weeks, sometimes eight, depending on which program it is and how quickly we're able to, if there's, um, how quickly we're able to as a grad community go through the applications so we do as as quickly as we can but the other thing to remember is you're not going to hear anything on your quest system there's no status change on that until it's gone through the entire process and the university has made its final decision so even though you're not seeing anything there's a lot of activity going on with that application um, by the time you do see something it's already gone through about three or four um, uh, reviews so it can take it can seem like a long time you know we work as quickly as possible once we get to the application deadline other than that it's it would have, it would be first come first serve and we can't do that with the larger programs Okay, great. Thank you. So wait for that deadline before uh, you start getting uh, a little too worried. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Hossein, circling back to, oh, Kim, yes. But really quick, sorry. But still, after saying all of that, if you're not sure about your application or if there's something missing, feel free to send me an, app, an email once you've completed your application. I'll be happy to go in specifically and take a look. Um, if there's anything needed with it, I can let you know right away. So don't worry if you, if you feel the need to contact me, send me an email, I'll, I'll see where you're at at the point. So okay, yeah, that's, that's great. All I had to add. Thank you, Kim. Um, Hossein, circling back to um, talking about finding potential and contacting potential supervisors, how long does it typically take for a, a prospective supervisor to get back to a student who's, who's emailed them? Well, uh, that's a really tough question, but it really could be varied. For example, if there is a during a conference, then it may take a week or so, or they may be you know, busy, you know, very with teaching and I know other projects may take you know a couple of weeks but there are some people that you know some faculty members that they reply you know promptly quickly to make sure that they go back but and frankly if you know if the supervisor uh, sees that is not uh, a good fit or is it not the obvious fit then they may not get back to you or they may for some of them they may forget to get back to you don't be again uh, discouraged to to contact people if you find a you know mutual interest and you kid you think that you can work with a potential supervisor. Great, thank you, um, Kim. Just a follow up question on what you just said about the the course uh, based programs. What you were saying about the deadlines, the committee review that's for course based programs, correct? For for research based programs, it's based on a faculty member accepting the student. Yeah, it starts out with the grad review committee, though, as well. For the research oh, they both programs. do. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, it, it kind of still kind of has to go through. The process is a little bit different and a little bit quicker for the research because it's a fewer fewer people that need to um, accept them. But um, otherwise, it's pretty much the same. Okay, and Kim, maybe briefly is um maybe one of our final questions um you had talked about the cel courses for students that were maybe looking to upgrade their 
their math background. Um, we're just having some questions. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on, on how that works? Sure. Um, they can register. CEL is the University of Waterloo Center for Extended Learning. And they have um, some courses online available. So you can, um, if you're out of country, you can start that process. You don't have to be on campus to take um, most of their courses. And that's why I point them, I point students to the CEL. There may be on campus versions of the same course, or you may find a university or college near you where you are that has an equivalent course. But this short list of CEL or extended learning courses gives you an idea of what you're looking for for the calculus or algebra level um, that, that the admissions committee would be looking for. If you do decide to take these courses, you don't have to be a registered student. You can take it as a non-degree and complete it. And if you're enrolled in it before you apply, you can upload your registration information so that you, we can see that you're um, adding math to your application. And then it would be reviewed pending com uh, successful completion of those math courses, um, if, if that makes sense. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Kim. We appreciate you elaborating on that. No Hussein, I think our final question I will direct to you. Um, can you just explain maybe how many students typically does um, management sciences accept in a, in a fall term intake? So PhD, MASC, MMSC, how many students generally getting admission? Yeah, for the MMSC, it's around 100 students per year, which is going to be fall pair. For MASC and PhD is really depending on the funding available, but we take, you know, something between 10 to 20 students per year. Great. All right. Well, that wraps up our Ask Me Anything event for the Department of Management Sciences. Don't forget, if you haven't yet registered for our Waterloo Engineering Graduate Studies Alumni Panel, which is happening this Friday, November 5th, from 12 to 1 Eastern Daylight Time, you can still sign up to attend. We will add the link in the information in the chat now. This virtual event will feature alumni panelists from our graduate programs who speak about the impact their graduate degree had on their career path. Thank you once again to all of our panelists. We look forward to welcoming you to Waterloo Engineering in the near future. Have a great day.